Hi, I'm Ari, I'm the Oak Witch, and in today's video I'm going to be talking about the reality of endangered sacred plants in witchcraft. So a massive discussion which gets had repeatedly in eclectic witchcraft spaces is the use of sacred indigenous plants, whether or not we should use them and whether or not they're endangered. What I see a lot usually is non-native people making oversimplified statements about these plants and talking on behalf of indigenous groups as to whether or not it's a close practice or whether or not you should use them. Just to give some background for those who don't know and have stumbled across this video, I am a British Latina girl living in England. I recently graduated a master's in wildlife conservation and here on this channel I love talking about witchcraft in ways which is more eco-friendly. I love framing magical practices in a way which benefits the environment and talking about all those things which I think is really useful in a witchcraft practice. The sole aim I have for this video is to discuss the conservation status and the ecology of these sacred plants as there is quite a lot of misinformation about that. What I'm not trying to do in this video is centre myself in the discussion as to whether or not you should use these plants in your practice if you are non-native. Of course I have my opinions based on the indigenous voices I've researched and read and listened to and I aim to carry on that message and center their voices here but overall I highly recommend that if you are concerned to do your research to read and to listen to these indigenous or native voices on the topic. So I've put some resources and references down below in the video description I might put it in the comments as well just so it's there for everyone to see and that can be a starting off point but please go beyond that research as well. The approach which I have in my craft and therefore what I suggest to my audience is to be respectful to decolonize your witchcraft practice and decolonize your witchcraft and magical practice involves researching, reading, listening and reflecting on topics of cultural appropriation, anti-racism and the effects of colonization on these marginalized communities. The thing which I've spoken about before on my channel, something I do in my own practice, is researching your local folklore, your local folk customs, and the wildlife, the flora and fauna that surrounds you. Developing a relationship with these spirits that surround you and forming a bond with literally the soil that you tread upon will serve you so much better in your witchcraft practice. It's something which you can relate to far greater than a practice which has been completely removed and divorced from its original cultural context. So the two plants which I'll focus on is white sage and palo santo. You see these plants discussed so much in online eclectic witchcraft spaces and although I'd never want to talk on behalf of any indigenous groups I find that as a creator who does have a platform where people discuss these things that come up I wanted to at least clear the air on the aspect which I think I have some authority to talk about having a background in conservation and ecology. So first and foremost how do you know if a species is endangered? How can we figure that out? I think this is something which is probably a good place to start off in terms of developing your plant magic and again this is something which I've spoken about on my channel. When you step into plant magic or developing a relationship with these plant spirits, these allies, a massively enriching process is learning about the ecology of the plant. It's all very well learning about the magical associations and what the plant can do for you but learning about the actual nature of the plant is really useful in providing these insights as well. And a great place to start is simply just googling the plant species. Usually there's enough information on there for you to gather some sort of information but you can just go to the plant species wikipedia page and on the page it has its conservation status. So this conservation status is usually gathered from the IUCN red list of threatened species which I'll get to in a minute. But depending on the country that you live in, there is an abundance of resources that will help you engage in your local flora and fauna and wildlife. For example, in the UK, we have the Wildlife Trusts and on that website, there's so much information about British wildlife and on specific species pages, you can see all of the detail about, you know, its habitat, its ecology and the protective legislation that is on the plant. So we have specifically the UK Biodiversity Action Plan Priority 
Arctic Species List. So this was detailed by the Joint Nature Conservation Committee and it's a list of protected species that are a priority in gaining conservation action. We also have the Wildlife and Countryside Act of 1981 and it's a wildlife law aimed to protect animals, habitats and plants. This act goes into a bit more detail of what native species are protected, what non-native species are not allowed to be introduced, what methods of interfering with wildlife are prohibited, etc. Things like that. If you're living in the UK that's just two of the wildlife laws that are quite good to know and to get familiar with and it's worth doing your own research on this. It's very easy just to type into Google your country and wildlife laws, legislation for wildlife, you know, type in keywords like that and just see what comes up. But some general useful resources include the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, IUCN standing for the International Union for Conservation of Nature and this red list is essentially a collation of plants, animals, fungus, etc. and a documentation of their global extinction risk. There is a structure of categories for this list and I'll list them here but the ones that are I guess worth knowing and paying attention to are near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, extinct in the wild and extinct. Least concern essentially establishes that it has been evaluated as a species as opposed to not evaluated or data deficient where there's you know it hasn't been evaluated and there isn't enough data to really establish a class or category. Where least concern is involved is essentially it has been evaluated and there's no reason to suggest that it is at risk for extinction. If anything it usually entails that the species population is quite abundant. The criteria for the red list is a 35 page document which I won't be going through in this video. Obviously I'll put it down below if you're interested but essentially what the criteria for these categories that the red list goes through it looks at the habitat what ecological conditions does the species reside in. We have the geographical range, so distribution of said species and whether or not it's naturalised in other areas. We have the use and trade, so what is the species used for, so for food or for medicine. We have population, so whether or not the population is at a stable level or whether it's increasing or decreasing. We have threats, so usually what human threats is the species at risk for. So usually these are factors that are affecting the population of the species. And we have conservation actions which details what actions are being employed to help the survivability in the population of the species. Another useful resource is United Plant Savers. This is specifically a North American organisation looking at certain plants that are essentially nearing depletion or in population decline. And the criteria for the species at risk list it has is looking at things like the vulnerability of the life history of the species, so looking at the reproducibility or the lifespan of the species, the effect of harvesting, so which part of the plant is the most harvested, the length of the harvest season and post-harvest recovery, the natural abundancy of the plant, so the spread of the plant's population and whether or not it's scattered, dense, sparse, etc. The vulnerability of the habitat, whether or not it's experiencing fragmentation, changes in land use and threats to that change in the acreage. And they also look at the demand of the plants. So, so this would look at cultivation, wild harvesting, yield per acre, etc. So when we established that these are the things which can really make a species at risk of being endangered or extinct, we can look at what needs to be protected and what needs to be carefully harvested for the things we use it for. So looking at organisations or resources for the country that you reside in for these plants is really important so you get a better understanding. So White Sage, going to start talking about the reality of this plant. White Sage or Salvia apiana is one particular species of sage. There are many different types of sage and sages are part of the mint family. White sage in particular is native to southwestern US and northwestern Mexico. Common sage, Salvia officinalis, is native to the Mediterranean and has been naturalized all across the globe. Common sage is, well, 
extremely common and it's used in cooking and gardening and you can go to home stores or garden stores even supermarkets and they have sage plants a completely accessible form of sage for your purification and cleansing practices so many people say that white sage is endangered but according to the IUCN red list it is not and many people run with this idea that it's not actually endangered so it's fine but that is not the case that's not to say that there isn't any protective legislation or endangerment of the plant as a species united plant savers have the species on their species at risk list with an overall risk score of 49 and how they gather that risk score is through the criteria which i mentioned before so the state is not able to withstand over harvesting or disturbance because every above ground part of the plant is used so it's really easy for the plant to essentially be over harvested to death Auntie Manda, a native from the organisation We Are Native, explains that the plant is at risk due to climate change, over harvesting and water shortages in California and suggests people buy from ethically cultivated sources and grow it yourself. An article that I read details Alicia Good Soldier of the Dine and Spirit Lake Dakota Nation's perspective that native people are actually having trouble finding sage due to the over harvesting and the wildfires. Sage along with sweetgrass, cedar and tobacco are one of the four plants really sacred to First Nations and Native Americans across Northern America. So as you can see this is a plant which is very sacred to native indigenous people and one which is actually quite fragile ecologically despite not being officially classed as endangered by the IUCN red list. And the second plant I want to talk about is Palo Santo and this is an aromatic wood that is usually sourced from naturally fallen trees lying on the ground. I think what gets people most confused is the fact that Palo Santo is a term used to describe a varying amount of tree species in Latin and South America and there seems to be two species in particular which stand out. So I'm probably not going to pronounce these right <laughs> but there is Beresa graviolens and there is Balnessa sarmentoi. The former has a conservation status of least concern with a stable population but it was near threatened in Colombia in 2007 I believe and is distributed all across Latin America. The latter, however, is classified as endangered with a decreasing population. It is endemic to the Gran Chaco regions of dry forest and is native to sort of this area. So I think what people tend to do is look at the Bolnesia Simon Toy version of Palo Santo and see the endangered list and go, it's endangered, uh, and sort of paint that brush for Palo Santo as a whole, but this is not necessarily true. However, this isn't to say that there are zero environmental concerns when it comes to all types of Palo Santo. So overall, there has been a loss and degradation of the habitat of dry tropical forests which the Palo Santo resides in. And this is because of human activity, deforestation, which has really declined the habitat quality. Also worth considering, like with white sage, there is a market demand for Palo Santo where the trees are actually cut off illegally and sometimes harvested before the appropriate mature age of the tree. So it actually takes five to eight years for the oil in the tree to mature. So once the tree is dead, it becomes fragrant due to the decomposition process. Thankfully, there are actually reforestation and regenerative programs put in place to help Palo Santo. Danny, a Ecuadorian native, goes by witchy sister on TikTok, explains that people justify the use of Palo Santo because it's just simply used as a bug repellent in native countries, which is true, but it's also true that it's also used in sacred ceremonial rituals, indigenous practices. Danny also has a really great video establishing the quality difference of a sustainably sourced native Palo Santo versus one that they bought at a botanica. I really recommend watching, I've put all those sort of links down below which you can check out. I hope that kind of clears the reality of the ecological and conservation status of those two plants and the fragility of these species due to market demand and our human activity and how this is also affecting indigenous groups and native people who want to use their sacred plants in their rituals but can't because of the commodification of these plants. Some closing questions I want to offer to you guys as food for four is why Palo Santo? Why white sage? Is using those plants a part of your tradition? Is it native to your land? Do you know of 
any other herbs or plants that can be used for the exact same purpose which is a part of your local land native to your country part of your tradition auntie manda from we are native outlines a bunch of herbs which are really great and act as alternatives to white sage and palo santo this is rosemary mugwort cedar thyme basil lavender and garden sage i think what's worth considering is no one group or community is a monolith of course there are individual varying opinions just as there are in any group in any community but what is worth considering is that one opinion doesn't give you a green light to disrespect a whole culture a whole group or practice but i'm just going to end this video with a couple of perspectives that may help you gather some insight. Tribal Trade, which is an organisation centred around connecting people with their native heritage and connecting native people to each other, explains that the practice of smudging and the use of sacred medicines is fine for those who don't come from indigenous culture so long as you're being respectful. Agent J. Keen, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, has a really great article on the website Native Appropriations and it discusses in context to the Sephora smudge witch kit, if anyone remembers that back in, I think it was 2018, how the smudge stick represents a deep pain, a sacrifice, resistance and refusal of native peoples. I think what many non-native people in our witchy communities don't realize there is a context of painful history of suppression native americans weren't able to practice their own religious and traditional rites so the commodification of smudging and the sacred plant medicines is disrespectful and it directly harms indigenous groups because none of that money is going back to native people this is why it's so important if you're dead set on using white sage or palo santo to buy from indigenous and native sources because you know it's going to be ethically harvested that's the end of the video i hope you guys enjoyed it i hope it was useful and please 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 go check out the resources i've put in the video bibliography down in the description in the comments if anyone has any resources for supporting indigenous groups for any perspectives on what i've spoken about please put it down in the comments i would love to add it to my list that i have in in the description and in the comments so please feel free to share please remember to do your own research to do your own reading and to listen to indigenous and native voices on this matter i just wanted to give my perspective as someone who really enjoys ecology and conservation and clear up the misconceptions mo mainly behind the extinction and endangered risk of these species which gets spoken about quite a lot in these witchcraft spaces so i hope that clears things up but yeah thank you so much for watching and i'll see you in the next one bye